Hello, and welcome to today's LinkedIn Live. I'm Tom Monahan, President and CEO of DeVry University. I'm delighted to be here today for another of our Digital Dialogues events. Today, I'm going to be talking with Jeff Miller, who's a DeVry alumnus and co-founder of PK, where he is still active as a senior advisor and board member. I also serve as a board member at PK and have had the chance to work closely with Jeff for a couple of years now. It's going to be exciting today as we dive into how technology is transforming the future of work. Uh, for those not familiar with PK, it is an experienced engineering firm with now more than 4,000 employees globally. Uh, it's routinely recognized as a global leader in putting a range of cutting edge technologies to work at the world's leading companies. It, it lives at the absolute frontier of technological innovation. A few recent examples of where PK has gained uh, recognition uh, our automation service line was just recognized as a mid-sized provider in the latest Forrester Now Tech, uh, continue automation, continuous automation and tech. We're recognized as a loyalty wave leader uh, for innovating in applying technology and design skills to great loyalty programs uh, in the retail sector and beyond. We're recognized as a strong performer, uh, performer among RPA providers in the Forrester wave, uh, highest possible scores for vision, roadmap and accelerators. Uh, Forrester, I think, captured it well by saying PK packs a big punch and approaches RPA services with both clarity of vision and extensive IP innovation. We, we could go on and on across any one of the most modern technologies supporting really leading edge digital experiences. Think about APIs, app modernization, what, whatever, whatever it takes to deliver a compelling experience for customers. And PK is recognized as one of the most innovative and creative and uh, compelling firms globally in these these critical areas. Um, I'm going to ask Jeff a few questions about kind of both his personal career and how you know the vision uh, that propelled he and his co-founders to building such an incredible business. And I get his perspective on uh, not only development in the technology arena, but also how uh, individuals, students, alumni, and people aspiring to build either great companies or great careers in this area uh, can learn from his experience. Um, we're going to save some time at the end for questions, and uh, we're going to answer as many as we can. Just uh, uh, log them into the chat, and we'll uh, make sure that we get to questions before we wrap up. But let Jeff, let's start with um, uh, your personal story. You were focused on tech from from the teen years, if not earlier. You know what what drove you to be interested in technology as a career? Well, you know, probably science fiction movies. I would say might be the 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 first thing. But, um, you know, I was, you know, gifted in math and that's kind of the direction some school advisors in high school were pushing for a career path and they offered a basic programming class, you know, in uh, my junior year of high school. And I took the class and I loved it and I ate it up and I was addicted. So that's kind of how I got most interested in it. And uh, fortunately for me, it's uh, transformed a lot of businesses over many decades and uh, I was right there with it. So you know, I was very lucky um, to have that start. You and I have talked about this uh, before that the, the perception, the difference between perception and reality around tech careers uh, may, may be one of the reasons that fewer people go into the technology field than, than either one of us would like. Uh, you made a pivot from being a kind of narrow technologist to uh, branching out to all phases of the technology business, uh, sales, recruiting, general management. Can you talk about that part of the career journey, moving from uh, narrow focus on technology creation to business creation and business application of technology? Yes, there's this introverted perception of, you know, what a computer scientist or an information technology specialist does. Um, I think with younger people in today's marketplace and, you know, in the past decades, um, the statistic when early in my career was American universities were producing about 40% of the demand of talent each year uh, that industry needed. Therefore, we had to go to other countries to find the talent and bring them to the United States. So um, everyone, I think at that time thought, okay, you're gonna sit in a dark room and you're gonna write code and it's a pretty boring career. You're not gonna interact with people. You're gonna be an introvert. Um, it's not gonna be any fun. We wanna do something more exciting. And um, that is absolutely not the case. 
<laughs> unfortunately, or fortunately for me, I should say, uh, when I first finished at DeVry and started working, um, I got in one of those jobs where I was literally sitting at a desk writing code and um, I was quite bored because I wanted to interact with people. Uh, I had studied project management and business analysis and design and um, I wanted to do that kind of work. I wanted to learn about the business and build solutions for the business, but it it wasn't quite that way. I had a senior person giving me specs and I would write code and many times I didn't even understand the business case or didn't need to. So I left that very quickly and uh, started recruiting, uh, working for a firm uh, which be, you know became uh, Rapidime over the years and grew up through that business uh, recruiting IT talent and uh, hired a lot of DeVry graduates during that time actually. And you and I were talking about even, even the core production of technology has changed. We, we, Jeff and I have swapped stories about when we, we were young computer scientists. Um, uh, it, it, there was some dark room to it, but now in the era of agile and tight links to business, even the most you know technology focused job has a radically different level of exposure to teammates and clients, et cetera. Yes, it does. Yeah, definitely. That that yeah, that's that's going to be an interesting shift. Well, maybe talk a little bit about you. D fast forward a little bit from um, you, you. You grew Rapidime to a to a sizable company, and we're running a big piece of it. Um, uh, sold the business to Fujitsu, um, and, and probably at that point could have had any job you wanted in tech or tech services, but you decided to, to, to go all the way back to zero in starting a company with, uh, with uh, uh, three great co-founders who, whom I know uh, quite well as well. But what, yeah, that, that's a pretty big risk to take having, had a, having been, had a lot of success and certainly having had a lot of opportunities to go all the way back to kind of ground zero and start from scratch. Should, love, love to hear that, that decision and what led to it and, and, and what, what led you to take that risk. Well, you know, my father, you know, he wasn't an educated man. He never had the opportunities, um, but he always told me, if you ever get a chance, learn a business from the bottom up, save your money or find investors and start your own. Because those are the folks who have the most fun in life, have the most pleasure in life. So, I, you know, I, I always kept that in the back of my head and I did every job possible at Rapidime. And um, there were some things we did really well at Rapidine. We caught a wave, which was the ERP wave. Mm -hmm. And we were predominantly an ERP implementer. But we saw very quickly you know, that the ERP providers were a couple of generations behind technology always. And it's just by way of nature of, their, of the product, they can't build something for everybody. They have to satisfy the general population and get about 70% of the requirement down. So we decided to, you know, when, when we, uh, when we left, so there was another person, Manish Mehta, who's one of the co-founders of ProKarma, who had um, gone to college with Vivek Kumar and had they, he and Vijay Eju and Manish all had the, their first jobs in India together. So they formed a bond. So the four of us started PK together and our focus was on leading edge technology and it was not on uh, packaged solutions. So we, we took a focus completely away from the you know, packaged products out there like the SAPs and the Oracles and we wanted to build custom leading edge software and we were you know, doing pretty much software for hire. So we were building it for the client, they would own it when we were finished. And um, we decided, okay, we're always going to reinvest back into the business and have a technology team always focused on what's coming next. So we would stay about a half a step ahead of customer demand when they would talk to us about early things like mobile solutions um, or you know e-business. You know, back in you know 2004 timeframe, we were ready, and you know we were we were always experimenting, we were always building, and we were willing to take on projects that, you know, maybe no one saw as possible. And we had, we were, you know, 
smart enough to hire some great people. And um, there's some great uh, technology visionaries in our firm, you know, from the early days. And we were lucky enough to take advantage of that. And we had clients who trusted us. They they said we would just be honest and tell them we've never been here before, <laughs> but we're going to try okay. and, uh, you know, let's do it together. And they knew that we wouldn't let them down. So, you know, most things that we were able to build for them were possible. And, um, you know, they believed in us because it was more about the relationship, you know, with the individual leadership in each account than it was about, you know, has it been done 10 times before? And I think people started to shift their mind frame, Tom, and their mind frame was more, you know, not where have you done it 10 times before? Because that's what most clients would ask. Um, but they wanted to know, what do you know about this? And do you think it's possible? I've been thinking about this. It might make our business leaders life easier. You know, as an IT executive, I want to do that. And I think we were lucky enough to, to get those opportunities with our clients in the early days. So innovation was always a focus. Now, back to your question about risk. Um, I always laugh when people say that to me because they were like, you took some incredible risk in your day. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Honestly, I always knew that I could get a job and I always knew that I could get a, you know, a fairly nice prevailing wage after I learned what I learned in my day, early days at Rapidime. Um, so there really wasn't a risk to it, Tom. Um, it was what, what I call it is a, a large reduction in income. <laughs> so, so, uh, you know, we, we did have an angel investor. We paid ourselves about 10% of what we were making before. And we worked really hard and we were passionate about, you know, growing the business and we were passionate about people. And uh, <clears throat> the four of us brought some of our best people we knew from the past with us. And um, we hired a lot of good people and we, we had a great team, still have a great team. And, and uh, that's the foundation for any good business is a good team and um you know i said the the founding principle you know for me building a team was never be afraid to hire somebody better and smarter than you are and um you know i've kept to that over time and uh i i was never the smartest person in the room and i didn't want to be you know that would i think that if you do that in your business um you're shortcutting yourself one, one thing PK did that and continues to do that that's really hard and most I want to say I'll use the word I don't want to use the word lazy but many firms are too lazy to do which is staying on the leading edge you'll often see a company come in you know on the leading edge in technology uh, and then kind of just follow that technology and almost rise and fall with it but not innovate and stay on the leading edge and you, I just we, we opened the call with just a a series of recent accolades that PK has gotten for, um, again, the kind of most cutting edge stuff. How, how did you all, it's pretty deep in the ethos of the firm to be always on the leading edge, uh, always uh, able to bring the most modern technologies to bear on clients. How, how I asked the question probably from two lenses, how did you all pull it off and anyone wanting to participate in the technology sector is trying to find a way to keep up with change and make sure they know what the leading edge is and make sure they know what the most powerful technologies are. How, how did, what, what advice would you have to companies or people looking to keep up in a fast moving environment like that? Well, you know, we had a secret weapon, I like to say, when it came to advancement of technology. And, and that was not just BJ Eju, one of the other co-founders, but his team of field generals, brilliant enterprise architects who, really helped him, you know, take the right path down the technology line. And that was one thing. Um, a second thing is we weren't afraid to take less money in payroll and invest it into research and invest it back into the business to make the business better. And th I think that is the best advice I can give is have the, the smartest, people um i remember for many years we had this thing in our denver office on the wall that said that little company can't build what you need to have built and we did it 
for less money, faster and better than the big players out there in the market at that time. And, you know, we were always hungry and we wanted to prove people wrong. We came with an attitude that, you know, you don't think we can do it, but we're going to we're going to make you wrong. We're going to show you that we can. So that, I think that's that was the secret. It's, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I don't think I'm telling a tale out of school, but at, at the onset, uh, you know, as I said, Jeff and I are colleagues on the board of PK now, and at the onset of the pandemic, um, you know, we, we you know, like 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 every other company, we had a board meeting to discuss what to do in the pandemic. And uh, unlike every other company, the question wasn't, you know, let's 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 pull back. The question was, we got to do more investment in front. <laughs> I read the board meeting. PK went the exact opposite direction, which is okay. This is. You know, the world's going to change. The the pandemic's going to change the world. Technology's going to accelerate. We have to invest more in R and D, and that's just pretty pretty deep in how you all how you all have built the uh, built built the company and built the culture. And obviously, it's paid huge dividends. Um, you you've got um, given your success, you've probably got a steady parade of young entrepreneurs, or or not not young entrepreneurs, but new entrepreneurs, or people looking uh, to uh, to 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 build a great company, showing up on your doorstep asking you for advice. You know how, how to build a great company, how to launch a great company. What what what's what's your talk track? What what do you tell uh, would be or new entrepreneurs to focus? What do you encourage them to spend their time on? Like how how do how do you help someone learn from your experience? Well, um, first I'll digress a second and say that's one of my new passions is to try to help people. Uh, learn what I didn't know um, earlier in my lifetime and uh, try to help advance them, especially if I like them. It could be acquaintances, friends, whatever. But <clears throat> one of the things I that I tell them is you need a mentor. And I think everybody needs a mentor. It doesn't matter what stage you are in your life. Your mentors do change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's it's funny because when Manish Mehta, our, one of our co-founders, turned 40, you know, you know, we were talking, we got a little bit emotional with each other, and he says, um, you know, you were my mentor. And I said, that's really funny because you're smarter than me, and you, you learned everything that the business had to offer through some of my teachings, but then you passed me, and you became my mentor. <laughs> and uh, he taught us all a lot. But um, I, I like to um, tell them that, They've got to work harder than anybody else out there that they're competing against. <clears throat> Their mindset has to be, oh my gosh, I'm not talking to my client today is my competitor. Um, I'm not in front of them. Um, or I am i can't sit back and take too much time to congratulate myself on something well done. <clears throat> I got to worry very quickly what I'm going to do next. And I, I think the, the, the bigger part of all that is centered around never getting satisfied with what you're doing. Um, you know, take, take a week each year to, to uh, celebrate your victories and your successes, but make sure you take 51 other weeks <clears throat> out working and outsmarting and out thinking and, and, you know, reinvesting back into your business. Um, <clears throat> I don't like to work with people who are in what I call lifestyle businesses where, you know, they build a business and you mentioned something about this earlier, Tom, where they, they ride a technology wave until it's, it's almost dead. It's like riding a horse till it's very last days and the horse is limping along. <clears throat> you can't do that. You've got to switch horses. You've got to, you've got to change your path and you always have to be innovating. Um, so, um, that's my best advice. The other thing, a lot of people come to me without a plan. They don't have a solid plan and they don't think about bad things that can happen in their plan and how they're going to respond. And they get very discouraged early on and they, they exit their businesses and go back to a regular job. And I think the, the other advice I give them is it's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard. And there's going to be times when you want to give up, but you can't. <clears throat> so, um, you know, and, and then the other thing I tell them is make sure you are more 
more well funded than you ever imagined you needed to be because mm -hmm. you can make money on paper, but you if you can't flow your cash right, um, your business is not going to last very long. So those are some of the pieces of advice that I give young people, young business owners. Jeff, you spend a lot of time uh, in to to this day spend a lot of time uh, interviewing and selecting talent. It's something you have great passion for, attracting great people, selecting them. You know, it, 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 one of the real challenges I think that PK has overcome as it's grown is not only being a fast growth company, but having that same strong culture that the four of you probably had when it was just the four of you. And that that's hard to do. So to, when when you're hiring someone, what do you look for? What do you look for to, to ensure you're bringing the right talent into an organization? What are your what are the key markers of future success that you've learned to uh, try to push for and probe for when you're when you're interviewing somebody? First, I look for someone who has a lot of responsibility and they can't afford to fail at the job. <clears throat> they, that could mean a number of things. It could mean a home, a family, children, kids in college. It could mean a lot of things. So, it, so they have to have that. Um, second, I look for job stability. Uh, you know, it, it, in the early days of IT, back in the 80s and the 90s, you know, everyone, there was a rule. Hey, you need to stay at each job at least a few years. And, you know, there were people that would last, you know, one place for a year and then go on to another. Um, sometimes people did that intentionally to advance their salaries mm -hmm. because they couldn't raise from their current employer without changing jobs. Um, so I look for job stability. But more than that, I look for people who are scrappy. I, I look for people who come with an attitude that they're going to prove everybody else wrong, that they think that they're going to fail or they're not good enough or they can't do something. Um, <clears throat> I look for hungry people who are who are really interested in making a big difference and outperforming the norm. So that's what I look for. And then I also I trust my gut. If your gut tells you that something doesn't smell right or look right, nine times out of ten, you're right. You should trust that gut instinct. So, um, and and then I look for validation. You know, I someone can tell you. The example I use all the time and um, is driving a car. I can tell you I know how to drive, and it sounds really good when I describe it to you, Tom. But until you get in the passenger seat with me, you have no idea if I'm good at it or not. So. Um, I need to talk to your customers who've ridden in the car with you. I need, you know, and and um, predominantly I get involved in hiring salespeople, and predominantly I get involved in checking references when we're doing an acquisition of another company. <clears throat> and you know, that that's what I look for is I look for people who can actually validate, you know, what what uh, I've been told or what I may have learned in the interview process. Question on the one thing that I, I think about as an as a university, um, you know, our our job is to supply great talent to businesses, um, and I hear from business leaders, you know, that that you, know, you hear great things about DeVry graduates, but you also hear, yeah, you know, hey, I wish, yeah, you know, from I wish the university system would do more to prepare people, et cetera. What what advice, yeah, you know, in in some sense. Um, yeah, you know, the the of uh, people coming off uh, off of university campuses, out of university programs. What what advice or what areas of focus would you like to see universities spend time on so that you know more people are ready day one to have impact in the workplace? Well, I think a lot of universities these days are too focused on the student, <clears throat> and I think they need to spend more time with the employers. Um, and of course, you know, you go after the large ones first, but I think the universities owe the student the opportunity to show them before they enroll that they're going to get life skills and get um, marketable skills in the process of the education. Um, the advice I give the student is look at each job 
opportunity as an entry point into the career. And the career can take you so many different ways. I see people today who are, you know, work their way up in IT and move over to the business side and they become heads of marketing, they become, you know, C-level executives uh, through the IT path. And, you know, information and technology has, you know, a much larger, um, you know, experience in any business today than it did, you know, 10 years ago or, or much more than 20 or 30. In that time, technology was a necessary evil. They needed us to um, do their accounting and file their taxes each year and tell them how much they sold and how much money they collected. Um, today, they need us to run the business and they need us to run the business day to day and there's much more involvement. So um, the other thing I would, the advice I would give a, a, a fresh graduate is try to work and in, in, in get in jobs with the leaders in, the, in their industry space. So, you know, in our case, we were very fortunate. Um, you know, a couple shout outs to some of my favorite clients. You know, T-Mobile is recognized as the innovative leader in the telecom space. And we've been working with T-Mobile for more than 10 years. And they keep throwing problems at us that need to be solved with technology. And we're able to do it because we have a great team. And they're a very supportive partner and um, you know it, it, it works well because if we go call on their competition, they're excited that we've worked with T-Mobile already. And I would tell your graduates the same thing: try to try to be employed by the leaders in their space. And I think that what that will open a lot of doors for you. Um, for one thing, the other thing I would tell tell them is you know embrace. The opportunities you have um, to learn about the business because that will make you more valuable. If you know technology without any business knowledge, you're not as valuable as you know if you really understand the business that you're in. And I think that's where our staff is um, is that they're very hungry to know about the customer's business. Even our people who are offshore in India or in Mexico or in Argentina, they want to know the customer. They want to understand the customer's problems. They want the customer to visit them. They want to visit the customer locations. And, um, you know, I think they're all anxious to get back to that kind of business, you know, post pandemic, um, because I think that's, that's where, you know, our staff and our clients have suffered the most is through, you know, lack of in-person interaction yeah. during this time. Questions that came in from Dolly is, you know, how how do you transition into the technology field? You know, what 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 is advice for someone who maybe is in a non-tech job, wants to transition to a more tech technology oriented role in their company, or maybe you know track down a company that's that is on the leading edge? What, what's the best way to kind of make a career pivot like that? I think you got to go to the people in the business um, who are on the technology side and talk to them. Um, you know, make your interest known and ask them, what would it take for me to get an opportunity transition? It could be education. You'd be taking a couple of classes potentially. Um, most people think, oh, no, you have to have four years of education and learn how to write code and learn how to, you know, build software. Well, you can move to IT in a business analyst role and still be part of the IT department and be a business expert helping guide the development process and the engineering process from a business viewpoint. Mm -hmm. So it's not as difficult as most people think to transition from the business to the technology side. Um, you could become a software tester to start, mm -hmm. um, you know, because you understand the business and you're being, you know, handed, you know, working code or, you know, working software that needs to be thoroughly tested, not only just for a, a, an accuracy standpoint, but from a regression or a load standpoint. So absolutely, there's it's an easy transition. Great. I'm getting I'm getting the signal that we're bumping up against time. This is uh, this has been terrific. I, uh, 
uh, I, I will, uh, I'll first and foremost, thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing. We covered a lot of ground from you know, career stuff to business building to future of technology. And it's been super helpful to me and super helpful to our audience. Uh, special thanks, uh, not only Jeff, but the audience for joining in. You can uh, follow uh, Jeff and I on LinkedIn. And, and obviously, uh, P PK's site has a ton of information. Uh, I, w I went through sort of a limited set of the uh, recent recognition that PK has gotten for uh, leading edge client impact and leading edge technology. But if you if you check out the PK site, pretty much every day something new is happening. So that's another great place to. Um, it's a shameless plug, Jeff. But it, when we talk about staying on the leading edge of technology, if you're uh, uh, if you just sort of hit the PK website and see some some of the case studies, that's uh, that's a great example of what the leading edge of technology looks like and how people are putting technology to work. Yeah. Um, so I will uh, uh, thank everyone. Um, uh, please follow DeVry on LinkedIn so you can hear about future di dialogues. And uh, we will have other events like this featuring, featuring uh, alums, business leaders, and technologists who are shaping the future of work. Uh, thanks for joining, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great day.